Okay, thank you everybody for coming back for our after, late afternoon session. Um, we have Dennis Bauer uh, with us from CSIRO. Uh, Dennis is the team leader in translational bioinformatics at CSIRO. And she's going to be telling us about how novel compute technologies um, uh, transform life science research. Thank you, Dennis. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> it's fantastic to be with you today. And I'm going to tell you three stories today. One is to talk a little bit about CSRO and what my team is doing and the rest of the ecosystem. Um, the other two are around the research that we're doing. One is about genome analysis, so trying to find disease genes. And the other one is around genome engineering. So then once we've found the disease genes, to modify them in the genome. But more to that later. So CSRO. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it's Australia's government research agency. At CSIRO, we're passionate about translating research into products that people can use in their everyday lives. So obviously, the most famous product that we've developed was the Wi-Fi. Uh, but there are other technologies as well. So for example, Arrogate was invented by CSIRO. And the paper money was replaced by plastic money, which is now exported to the rest of the world. UK, you're welcome. So the Wi-Fi equivalent of the program that I'm in, which is the Australian, um, which is the Australian eHealth Research Centre, is CardiHub. So CardiHub is a mobile app that is used for cardio, for you know, heart rehabilitation. So once you had a, a stroke, um, you would think that a life-changing event like that will give you, will get you into better habits. Turns out it's not. So a little app that can gamify this whole experience and make this more accessible by having it directly on your app rather than you going to a physician increases the uptake by 30% and the completion by staggering 70%. So this little app really has saved lives already. So with that introduction, let's go to what my team is working on, which is genomics. So as we heard this morning, genomics is actually influencing everything, every aspect of our life. It determines how we look, what kind of disease risks we have, and how we behave. So I always like to do this little experiment um, with people saying, how is your thumb looking? Does your thumb has the last digit going a little bit back, a little bit more um, to this side, which is the hit taker's thumb, so when you look at your thumb, or is it straight up like mine, which is the boring kind? <laughs> so there will be um, one third, I think, in the audience that will have a thumb that is a little bit going backwards compared to the boring variety that I have. Even more fun is coriander taste. So there will be passionate coriander haters. Probably we're a little bit too small an audience, but are there any passionate coriander haters in here? Uh, oh, wow, OK. <laughs> So usually it's one in six that hate coriander with a passion. So again, this comes down to how your olfactory receptors perceive the taste of coriander, which can, I'm told, be very um, soapy. So CSIRO is actually doing research in that. And next time when you invite me, hopefully I have more uh, nuances on how people hate coriander. So with that, coming back to the disease risk, which is you know, a little bit more serious on the serious note. So when we're trying to find disease genes, we usually have, so every bar represents the genome of a, a, a person. We do have the two genes, which are the protein coding regions that we heard of this morning. And we heard that 99.5% you are identical between the person, or you and the person next to you. You share 99.5% of your DNA, which means that there are some differences. And these you know, blue boxes highlight the differences that make you, you. And those differences can be good, but they can also represent a disease. So when we try to find the disease gene, we usually recruit cohorts that are the healthy individual versus the ones that actually express that particular disease. So, and we want to find what are the variants, the mutations, or the changes in the genome that the um, disease cohort carriers that are absent from the controls. Now, obviously, this is a little bit oversimplified, but you can think of it in that perspective. And this is sort of 
is a classic machine learning approach. Are there any machine learning people here in the room? Okay. So if you're not a machine learning person, don't worry about it. Um, basically, this concept holds that all we want to do is find the things that are in one cohort and not in the other cohort. So this sounds trivial enough, but the problem is that the data sets that we're dealing here with are really large, which we already heard of this morning. So this graph shows from 2000 when the first genome was sequenced up until um, you know, today-ish that the capacity has increased. But it will continue to increase if, if it continues to increase at the same rate, which we can expect that will happen, then we're going to deal with 20 exabytes per year of new data that would be generated in genomics. Which, when you look at the traditional big data resources, which used to be astronomy, Twitter, and YouTube, genomics combined will be four times larger than that. When you let that sink in, it sort of, it shows you that there, there will be a lot of data pros or produced in the medical space that traditional big data, the traditional big data community is not equipped of dealing with, let alone the bioinformatics community. So definitely we need to work together to come up with solutions that solve this problem. So coming back to our research, we are looking for disease genes. So specifically, we're looking for disease genes in ALS, which is an, a motor neuron disease that Stephen Hawkins has. And um, it's affecting a lot of people worldwide. It's a nasty disease in that um, you start to be paralyzed and eventually you'll die. So this is a, definitely a disease you want to find out what is the cause of it. And on top of that, can you find something to at least slow it down? So find a cure for ALS. And that goal is taken on by the Project MINE, which is an international consortium, mainly led um, from Europe, that recruited or has the plan of recruiting 15,000 individuals with ALS to sequence their whole genomes and then compare that to 7,000 individuals that are normal controls. So in total, there will be 22,000 individuals where we have the whole genome. So again, this is a task that is quite daunting. So let me put this into the ecosystem of how I think of you know, big data analysis. So we're all familiar with the desktop compute, which nowadays with the ARM processors and things like that, they are quite powerful. Obviously, they're not powerful enough to deal with that kind of data that we're talking about here. So the next step up of that is high performance compute, where you have lots of these you want lots of these nodes that have CPUs on there. Um, they're in a pizza box, and but all of those nodes are sort of they're not talking to each other. You can make them talk to each other with bespoke um, software, but it's you know it's a bit of an art to write that reliably um, in large scale. So therefore, the way I think of you know these new technology that has come out, which is Hadoop and Spark is sort of to make this talking to each other between processors, between CPUs, easier and standardizing that. So in my mind, it sort of dissolves the boundary between the nodes in giving you access directly to the compute, to the CPUs that are in that environment. And if you're then using a public cloud provider, then the amount of CPUs that you can recruit is basically well, infinite <laughs> to some extent. So therefore, the way I think about it, it's sort of it's dissolving the boundaries and it gives you the ability to access the vast amounts of compute that is available in public cloud providers. And this is what we, what we capitalize on when we um, developed our software. So as I said, we want to use machine learning and particularly we want to use random forests. If you don't know what random forest is, don't worry about it. It's a machine learning technique. Um, that is typically used in, you know, in cases like that where you want to find a particular variant compared to your control cohort. So traditionally, um, random forests are not paralyzed. And if they're paralyzed, they're usually paralyzed by building trees because random forests are individual decision trees. But this is not good enough for paralyzation. We want to paralyze at the node level of each decision tree 
let alone of the whole forest. And traditional solutions developed by Google, which is a planet application, um, stuffing basically the whole, um, the whole feature space into one node. Which is great if you have your traditional customer analysis um, data sets where you have one customer and you have maybe 20 features describing that customer, the age, where they live, and so on. But we're talking about here the whole genome, which is not 100 features, but it's actually 3 billion features. So therefore, putting 3 billion features into the memory of one, of one CPU is, you know, is just not feasible. So an alternative solution was developed by Yahoo and Berkeley, which was published um, two years ago now <laughs> uh, at the Spark Summit, which says, OK, if that is not fitting into memory, then how about we flip the whole thing and put the samples into memory? So one feature and all the samples into memory, which is great if you have a data set that is quite small. But we're talking about here 22,000 individuals times 3 billion you know, features. That's a bit tricky to actually put that in. So therefore, our solution is then to split the whole thing and operate on the um, you know, split by by rows, but then have not the whole thing in memory, but actually process or handle the individual um, unit by itself, the individual cell, if you want to think of it. And this is very spark that we come up with. I'm not going to go into detail. If you have questions around how this works, come to me afterwards. But what I want you to take away from this is that with this, we can do classification. So we have a cohort. We want to learn who is who has a disease, who is healthy, we can do that with this approach, as well as finding out which are the disease genes, which in our case is the traditional genome-wide association studies. So, and to demonstrate that this is actually working better than what Google or what the typical parallelization approaches are out there. Sorry, the axes are missing. So, obviously we have the accuracy, uh, low to high, and the speed. So how fast you could process the whole data set. Spark ML is the planet, Google's planet uh, implementation of random forest. And it's ranging you know, somewhere in terms of that it's not very fast and the accuracy is not very good. Whereas the implementation that we have for this particular data set, which is incre incredibly wide and quite, quite large as well, is that variant Spark is a better solution. And the reason that it's more accurate is that you can use the whole genome rather than just a small representation of it. So with that, I thought I'd give you a quick demo of um, the notebook that we, that we have developed for that. So if you're not familiar with notebooks, who is familiar with notebooks? OK, good. That's probably almost everyone. But as sort of a quick recap, the way I think of notebooks, it's sort of a, visually, a visual representation that you can type in your code. You quickly can execute that, just that code bit, get your results out, um, and then move on to the next. So it's sort of a cross between make files and um, a PDF. So therefore, we have come up with a toy example that showcases if you take in your genomic data, you analyze it with VariantSpark, you can get some results out of it. In this case, it was patient ethnicity, or in, the, in that picture, it shows pa patient ethnicity for clustering approaches. But what I want to talk to you today about is finding disease genes. So we have come up with a toy example, because obviously I can't show you real patient data here. So what we have come up with for our synthetic data is a phenotype that mimics how real-world phenotypes will evolve. So they will have multiple components of the genome working together. In this particular case, it is the hipster, the hipster index. So it tells you whether you're a hipster or not, which means that we've picked genomic location that has something to do with how the phenotype works together. So tech shirts, for example, the monobrow, facial hair, and massive coffee consumptions. I'm sure that sounds familiar <laughs> to some. So, but coming back to you know, a little bit more earnest things here, 
in that we try to mimic a real life disease, which is that these locations that we picked here, those four locations, they're working additive, they're working multiplicative, they will have different weights. You know, in our case, the monobrow is the most important feature, I'm not sure. But sort of a real world disease will have similar, similar properties. And for traditional um, technology of doing GWAS analysis, association analysis, picking out things that work together in order to form the genotype is really difficult. So therefore, the first thing, obviously, that you do is you load in your data. And here we have uh, the data deposited on an S3 bucket, which is a cloud storage at Amazon. But you can have your data located anywhere that is publicly available or accessible. So you can load those variances with a Scala, um, with, with a Scala API. We do configure the data set a little bit. So usually with, with um, genome-wide association studies, you have to do a lot of pre-work. Using machine learning, that is, not, that is not necessary, which is another advantage. And running the analysis is really as simple as you know, running it this way and getting the important score. So the important score tells us for each genomic location how much does it contribute to the genome which with our hope, of course, that the four locations that actually went into the synthetic data are the ones that are coming out at the end. So with the other benefit of a notebook, and this particular notebook is um, running on Databricks, is that you can mix your uh, programming languages. So while the other stuff above was um, Scala, down here we have an SQL query and further down, we have the Python code. And I just noticed that all the, sorry, all the plots are missing. So all the things that actually are supposed to be there as the output is actually missing. So let's ignore that. Let's go straight to the infographic, which tells us that it actually worked. So again, remember that this is, um, that this was a synthetic data set where we put in four locations of the genome. We had this complicated score in order to score each individual of the 1,000 Genomes Project, which is a publicly available genomic data set. So we scored each individual whether they are a hipster or not. And then we applied a threshold. We said everyone above 10 is for sure a hipster. Everyone below that is normal, right? So, and this zero and one, together with the genomic profile is the only information that we gave variance bark. So variance bark's task was from this zero and one to find out which of those you know, locations, that, of those genome-wide locations, are actually the ones that have informed the score. And as you can see from the plot, indeed we were, <laughs> it was fortunate that the four locations that we wanted to find are actually the ones that are standing out like a sore thumb. So if you're not familiar with that kind of representation, what we have down um, at the x-axis is every chromosome that is in the human genome. And on the y-axis, we have the importance score. So this again tells you how much each location has contributed or has, is associated with the disease. And the higher the dot, where each dot represents a genomic location, the more associated it is. And obviously, you can see that the four locations, the monobrow, the facial hair, and the you know, fabulous hair in general, the textured and the coffee consumption is actually, uh, was picked out as the stuff that is associated with the, with the disease. So in summary, if variance bar can pick our synthetic data, which was reconstructed in a way that we think complex, multigenic diseases work, we are quite confident that it will do a similarly, you know, similarly convincing job on real world data and finding the disease genes, where these locations will be actually the location that make the disease. Yeah. There is, so if you, want, if you want to run this yourself, you can just go in and copy the whole notebook, change the location of the S3 bucket to your location, 
then provide the labels that make sense to you in your case that are you know, that describing a phenotype and just follow these instructions and just execute it. If the data set is relatively small, you can do it for free on um, Databricks. So what they do is they spin up an AWS cluster in the background and let you use that for free. So for small data sets or you know, a smaller representation of your real data set just to get your feet dirty, wet, this is the way to do it. Okay, going back to the presentation. Yeah, and we, we've written a blog post together with Databricks about this, which, is, um, which describes this in a little bit more detail. And you can find that by just typing in Databricks and Variance Spark to Google. So I know that some people um, don't like Scala, I've been told. So therefore, we also made this available through a Python API. And this was done by Deus, which is a consulting company in Melbourne. And so it's a, it's a nice way of um, how a really successful consulting company took out their time to volunteer their expertise to help in you know, research, a research project like that. So if you're in, the, in that uh, fortunate situation that you might have a little bit of time left over and would want to contribute to the research community, we have plenty of small projects like that where your expertise, your domain expertise would help enormously because in most cases, you know, our developers are not professional developers. They're professional researchers that happen to write software in that way. Okay, so with that, I would like to change gears a little bit and talk about genome engineering. So I'm sure you have heard of genome engineering of CRISPR and that it is a new technology to potentially ring in a golden age of medicine. And the reason I'm saying this is that with the CRISPR technology, you now can go in and edit the genomes of living cells really precisely, which you know, really is a game changer. It can help manage chronic diseases as well as you know, informed treatments. And the, why I'm saying chronic diseases is because there was a Nature publication last year that demonstrated how close we actually are of doing that for human no, human material. So they took human stem cells, human embryos, and uh, human embryos or fertilized eggs, edited, the, edited them in order to remove a genetic disease that is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which one in 500 Australians, I think, carry, which it's a heart disease where your heart wall becomes thicker and thicker and eventually can result in sudden cardiac arrest and death if it's not detected early. So this definitely is a disease that you A, would like to know about and B, would like to do something ideally about from the beginning. So this um, article has shown that in seven out of ten embryos you can actually edit out that mutation because it's a single mutation that causes this disease. Which is great news except that in three out of ten it did not work. So when you think of this being your unborn child, then three out of 10 failure rate is probably a little bit too high. So therefore our aim is to write or to develop a computational framework that allows you to make this, you know, this edit, to do these editing steps more efficiently and make them work the first time every time. So the two things we do in order to achieve that is by increasing the speed and the scale of this. And ultimately, this allows us to do more accurate uh, predictions. So the speed, we've obviously you know, taken the, uh, the tools that are out there, rewrote them, and made them parallel so that each task in itself is running in seconds. Now, the problem is that researchers might not want to do that on one gene, but they might want to do that genome-wide, which means that one second thing needs to scale to the whole genome, which is, you know, depends on who you ask and what a protein is, 20 to 100,000 entities. And it needs to be something that researchers can access through the internet, a web-based, ideally a web-based tool. 
So if it's a web-based tool that is running in seconds and needs to be scalable, that is a quite difficult task to achieve until um, Lambda functions came along. So this is serverless application, which really allows you to not have to spin up a whole instance in the cloud in order to make that analysis work or keep that instance running, which will be prohibitively costly, but to do those small steps of analysis, those small functional bits instantaneously and scale it up to the amount of resources that you need. So with that, we were the first large scale workflow that actually used Lambda functions, certainly in the research space, which with a complicated research framework. And with that, we did receive a lot of um, international attention for that. Can I have a quick show of hand? Who would like me to walk through this in, in really detail? Serverless architecture. Ta two? OK, I take that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the architecture here, the aim was to have a web page that talks to you know, beefy compute in the back end and gives results back to the researcher through, through the web page. So therefore, what we have here is this is our web page, this is our user, and he or she triggers through the web page an API, an API call, which is the API gateway here. So the API gateway, all you do is you say, I want to have this particular genomic region, please identify target sites that are in there. Or, and I should say that GT Scan 2, which is what we have here, is basically the search engine, or you can think of it as a search engine for the genome, where researchers type in the genomic location they want to edit, and it will find the optimal sites to edit that genome with, because there could be multiple sites, but not all of them work equally well. So therefore, a researcher types in the genomic location that they want, and then that gets deposited into a database. So a serverless database on AWS is called DynamoDB database, and basically it's just a database. But the other cool thing a DynamoDB database can do is it can trigger Lambda functions. So Lambda functions, as I said before, are these, I think of them as sort of free-floating CPUs that you can recruit and you can say, please calculate or process this particular function, and it will do that. So therefore you can load up a, a Lambda function with a small code snippet. So in our case, the first task in order to find target sites is to find, um, or to trigger a regular expression that goes through that particular location and finds all the possible candidate, um, candidate target sites. And those candidate target sites then get deposited into a second DynamoDB database. So from that, we do have the on-target scoring, which basically says how well this particular target site will attract the genome engineering mechanism, and the off-target scoring. So the off-target scoring is something that you can think of as that this particular site, which usually is around 20 um, nucleotides long, in a 3 billion letter long string, a 20 long nucleotide will appear randomly and multiple times. Therefore, if you pick a particularly repetitive region, then you could have uh, your editing machinery not target the hydrotropic cardiomyopathy gene that you want to, but the critical for life-sustaining gene over here, and that's probably not a good thing. So therefore, you need to find target sites that are unique. And this is basically this whole thing um, that is triggered up here. There is some um, speciality in there in that the genome is quite large, and those lambda functions, as brilliant as they are, they are also limited in that they only allow a certain amount of information to be processed and a certain runtime. Therefore, processing the whole genome at the same time, or you know, in one go, is just too large, and it will exceed the limitations of a lambda function. Therefore, we needed to split that up into smaller parts, and there are some some niftiness to that that I'm not going to go into detail with. So with that, this is how it looks like. Every location here is a potential target site in that genomic region, and you can see there are a lot. And remember, you, 
you would be a researcher looking at you know, all those options. They could be, you know, you could pick them randomly, and some of them are good, some of them are horribly bad, and you waste your, you know, your precious, your, your embryo on something that is not going to work. Therefore, a GT scan is helping you score those, and does that by saying green is a good target site and black is a target site you better not waste your resources on. Good. So with that, I said our main objective was for researchers to do that online. So obviously, if they do that online, they don't want to wait for you know, hours, days, for the results to come back. They have the expectation that it comes back instantaneously. Therefore, we need to come up with a framework that is really efficient. And serverless architecture is really neat in that it costs not very much. It's scalable, but the downside is that debugging and finding the bottlenecks is really difficult, or it used to be really difficult, until X-Ray has come along. So X-Ray is another AWS service that lets you look at your DynamoDB, your, um, your Lambda function, and your API gateway, and find where are they you know, bottlenecks in terms of the compute time. So therefore, we surveyed all our functions. So these are all the functions that are part of our serverless framework and their runtime. And you can see there is one particularly bad offender, the target sgRNA scorer, that takes more time than all the others combined. So obviously you want to do something about that particular. And it's a Perl script in case there are any Perl haters. This will, <laughs> you will love this. So therefore, the old framework obviously was to have, um, and there was another function that was equally, you know, would take a long time as well. So therefore, as a machine learning lab, we thought, oh, we can do better with machine learning. So we came up with a new Lambda function, a target scorer, that does the same things as these two other functions, but much quicker. And as you can see in gold here, this is the actual time then that the new function took instead of this time. So ultimately, we managed to improve the runtime for fourfold, so 80% improvement. Um, so therefore, if you have a serverless architecture, I encourage you to have a look through X-Ray in order to find any bottlenecks that are there. So with that, I do still have a little bit of time left. So I do want to have a, um, show you a quick other Notebook. So this is a notebook. And again, a notebook I sort of see as a way of for researchers to share their workflows, produce interoperable research, so research that where the outcome can be integrated into the next, the next analysis pipeline, and also reproducible research, so that if one researcher is running it, the next researcher is running it, the, you know, the results match up. And specifically in genome engineering, obviously, this is a task that is highly desirable to be able to reproduce exactly you know, what you've done. But it's also a tricky task because finding the optimal target site can vary between the tissues that you're looking into. So for example, a heart tissue might have different properties than a lung tissue. Or in our case, a blood cell you know, the, the, sorry, the, the, the cells that are swimming around in the blood, whole blood, might have different properties to heart cells. And we might only want to target the blood ones, but want to keep the rest of the, of the body the same or untouched and be using heart cells sort of as a proxy for the rest of the body. So our task here was to find a target site that is only active in blood, in whole blood but not active in heart. And the way to do that was to use GT scan, which can give you the activity of target sites in heart and in blood, but you can't do that you know, jointly. For that, you would have to download the data and upload it or you know, include it into R or into, load it into Python and analyze it there. Or you could run it directly in a notebook and with that, if you're in a notebook, if you're in a browser anyway, 
you might as well use an API to call ggscan because that's what it has, right? The API gateway, the yellow, the yellow thing that I showed you. So therefore, this notebook tells you how to trigger a GTScan2 call through the API and retrieve data back into a notebook. So obviously, we need to set up um, our, our notebook. And you, you will recognize things that were discussed this morning, like NumPy or, or Pandas. So the first thing is that we want to define the areas that we, that we are interested in. So this is this particular genomic, um, genomic region that we're interested in and the cell type that we want to have a look at. So this is um, neurophils in blood, whereas this one is neurophils in heart. So these two things we post to GTScan2 through the API, which is done with this particular call. We then can retrieve the uh, um, the ID that DT scan assigns to that particular job task back. And once we have that, we can retrieve the actual data. So in this particular region that we, um, that we submitted, there are 158 locations in the genome, or well, target sites in the genome that we want to score. So therefore, now in, um, in this object, we do have all the target sites listed along with their score between, well, for blood and for heart. So this is just to, to transform the data a little bit to actually be able to plot it. And this is how it looks like. It looks, so we represent it in a similar way as GT scan actually would, with green triangles being high active sites and black triangles being low active sites. So this up there was the blood data. This is the heart data. Looks um, pretty similar. It will be a hard task to actually spot by eye the actual difference. But we don't have to because obviously it's in a, um, in a notebook. So therefore, we can just, um, sorry, that's it. We can just do the where. This one is the same which will assign the blood activity and the heart activity. And then we can look at the delta. We can assign same if it's the same activity and assign a high, for example, if the blood activity is higher than the heart activity. Pretty trivial stuff, but given that before you couldn't do that, and with a notebook it makes so much sense because this is sort of the analysis that you would want to do. I thought it would be worth sharing with you. So therefore, in the end, you can pretty easily plot you know, your, this one particular target site that will be good to target in, if you only want to um, edit blood cells and leave the rest of the body with heart as a proxy alone. Uh, uh, sorry, it's <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the enthusiasm. <laughs> So therefore, let me summarize that. Um, I think it's pretty crucial in, in genomic research, in genome engineering, to do reproducible, interoperable research. And this particular interaction by just having an API call, which you already have, and linking that up with a Jupyter notebook, or SageMaker, if you're, if you're more into the AWS um, services, is a way to do that. And we do have an example on SageMaker as well. Good. So with that, we produce two open um, source tools. One is VarianSpark, the other one is GTScan. VarianSpark, um, yeah. So VarianSpark is a genome analysis tool where you can find disease genes. It's using machine learning, particular random forests, and a Hadoop Spark in order to crunch not only large amounts of data, but also wide data, so a lot of information per sample. The other one is TTScan2, which is a genome engineering analysis that is using serverless architecture on AWS to identify target sites that are tissue specific in order to recruit the genomic machinery optimally. With that, um, I want to thank the team. 
and highlight the upcoming conferences, particularly in India and in Singapore that we are speaking at as well. Thank you. All right, on the program we have a break right now, um, a five minute break, but if anybody has a question, maybe we could use some of that time uh, and those of you who need to go uh, can also go. Um, questions for Dennis? So we don't tend to not forget to switch off instances. That is <laughs> rule number one. Um, yeah, so most of this, because it's so experimental, with us being the first to use serverless architecture and with Hadoop, or the, you know, SageMaker and things like that, it will be one of the first applications as well. We do get a lot of um, support from AWS directly. But in saying that, the actual analysis if, we, if we're running actual analysis, which we do on AWS, it doesn't cost that much. And in fact, we did a comparison and um, yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't cost that much and it's, it's probably a good idea to actually do the comparison between on-prem compute with all the hidden costs involved compared to AWS. And if there are other people in the room that are thinking about the same thing, it would be great to convince the funding agency to actually see AWS or Google or Alibaba or Azure resources as infrastructure. So I'm, I'm on a crusade to convince the funding bodies to fund you know, things like that as a normal infrastructure grant. So if you want to join that crusade, come and talk to me. Okay. Um, maybe time for one more quick question, uh, if anybody has one. If not, we'll, um, we'll thank Dennis again and move on to our next speaker. Thank you.